Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me uh, to the symposium. I think these are very worthwhile events that uh, BioRed puts on, so that's good. Um, I am a professor of pathology at Creighton University. Uh, I, I teach a lot in, at Creighton University, medical students, uh, dental students, et cetera, so I do a lot of teaching. I also direct three microbiology laboratories, the VA, our local VA medical center. I direct that micro lab. I direct uh, the lab at the Creighton University Medical Center itself, and then at our new conglomerate, the Legion Creighton Laboratory, which we recently merged with the Legion system. So I direct that lab as well. So today we're going to talk about HIV uh, infections and laboratory diagnosis. So a little bit has changed in this area. I want to talk to, to you a little bit about that, but I also want to give kind of a refresher background on HIV and, and uh, some of the epidemiology and characteristics. So HIV infection, or HIV is the etiologic agent of AIDS. 35.3 million cases worldwide, 2.3 million cases, you know, in 2012, which is the last uh, most recent year I could find data. 1.6 million deaths that year, fourth leading cause of death worldwide, second leading cause of death in young adults, and remember, young adults are not supposed to die, they're supposed to live longer, so uh, obviously this has, a, has a, a, a big impact on that. The disease itself is a progressive deterioration of the immune system and is usually fatal if untreated. So this uh, map kind of shows where uh, HIV is seen in the world, you can see the uh, North American continent about 1.4 million cases, uh, but the bulk of cases in the world are in Africa. Uh, you can see 23.5 million cases in sub-Saharan Africa, so big impact on that continent. Historical background of HIV infection is quite fascinating, and it could be a whole uh, hour presentation in and of itself. Uh, first well-documented case goes back to 1959 in an African man. Was, but it wasn't until 1981 that we started recognizing that we were dealing with something new. Uh, this really occurred, those that have uh, more, about as much longevity as I do, may remember the, the cases of Kaposi's sarcoma and pneumocystis, what was then pneumocystis carinii pneumonia, now pneumocystis gerovecchi, in young homosexual men. Uh, no explanation, these were healthy people, these were diseases that you did not see in young men or young people, young healthy people, and all the patients were noted to have depletions in their CD4 positive uh, helper T cells, which are an uh, important cell in the immune system. AIDS was then subsequently found in IV drug users, hemophiliacs, infants born to mothers with, with, uh, with the disease. All of this suggested a bloodborne or sexually and or sexually transmitted pathogen. So in the mid-80s, uh, lots of stuff started happening. Uh, in 1983, the virus itself was isolated. Um, lots of controversy about who was the first to do that. Again, that could be another hour lecture. Um, but it was a, found to be a novel human retrovirus. Uh, in 1984, AIDS became a reportable disease. And in 1985, quite a banner year, the first test was developed. And the first antiviral drug that had some activity and some efficacy in patients uh, was um, released, cytobutene, or AZT, as it was called at the time. And the gen genome was sequenced. All of that were, all of those developments were very important in subsequent developments uh, for understanding HIV infection and for diagnostics. Again, the origin of AIDS, quite an interesting story. HIV uh, strains seems, seem to have arisen from non-human primate lentiviruses. Uh, West African prostitutes had antibodies that actually reacted more to simian immunodeficiency virus than they did to human immunodeficiency virus. And then in 1986, HIV-2 was isolated which was actually more closely related to the simian immunodeficiency viruses than HIV-1, then, then it was related to HIV-1 itself. So a couple different simian immunodeficiency viruses were described, one from uh, Mangabe monkeys, uh, very closely related to HIV-2, one from chimpanzees that was more closely related to HIV-1, 
and the range of these um, uh, uh, hosts was West Equatorial Africa, and uh, subsequently three genetically diverse groups within HIV-1 were described. The M group, which is from, for Maine, the O group stands for outlier, and the non-M, non-O groups, which were called N. So this kind of puts, in, this little chart here puts in perspective how the different viruses are related to each other. You can see that HIV-2 is more related to the simian immunodeficiency virus that came from the monkeys, and HIV-1 is all the way on the bottom there, not really related to HIV-2 much at all, but more closely related to the simian um, immunodeficiency virus. As far as the virology goes of the, of the virus, it's an enveloped, single-stranded RNA virus. Uh, it's in the family Retroviridae, the genus Lentivirus. So Retroviridae uh, all have reverse transcriptase enzymes that make uh, DNA, a DNA copy out of uh, the RNA genome. That's called cDNA. Uh, the virus will then integrate, once it infects the cell, will integrate into the host genome and become a latent provirus, um, cytopathic, the virus itself is cytopathic, non-oncogenic, doesn't cause cancer or anything like that, and results in some very slowly developing disease due to this latency. Three distinct genetic groups within HIV-1, as I mentioned, M, O, and N, all uh, different because they have sequence diversity in their gag and envelope genes. Um, the M group, or sometimes known as major group, predominates. Um, genetic subtypes within that group are sometimes called clades, uh, A through D, F through H, J and K, and there are some recombinants now being described uh, among those. The B clade is the one that predominates in the United States, but the C clade is actually dominant worldwide. Uh, o group, uh, quite rare, Cameroon, Gabon, Equatorial Guinea, uh, N group, Cameroon as well. HIV-2, about seven subtypes there, A and B dominate, and, and these are primarily seen in West Africa, although there has been some spread in recent years. So here's uh, kind of a similar uh, chart showing how the different HIV-1 viruses are related to each other and then related to the simian immunodeficiency viruses. So the A, B, C, D, that's all the clades, and then the groups M, N, and O, and how they're related to each other. And then you can see also the simian, how the, they fit in with the simian immun immunodeficiency viruses. This, this map shows how the distribution of the subtypes of HIV-1 look worldwide. And you can see in the light purple, that's the B subclade, and that's predominant in the, in the North American continent but it's, it's pr pretty much absent in Africa. Remember, that Africa is where most of the cases are, and that's where the C clade predominates and a variety of subtypes within that. The virus itself is 100 to 150 nanometers. It's got a lipid envelope and a, a core attaining, containing two copies of the single-stranded RNA. Uh, the genes, uh, major genes, are the GAG genes, which code for the structural proteins. The pole gene, which uh, codes for the viral enzymes like the reverse transcriptase, for example, and the ENV genes, the envelope glycoproteins. There's also a long, -term, uh, long terminal repeat and an open reading frame. So this little cartoon shows where all the viruses, uh, proteins, and what have you fit into the structure itself of the virus. Uh, a lot of these proteins are made as uh, large precursor proteins, which are then uh, cleaved or cut into the various uh, proteins that uh, we uh, have become very familiar with. So the GAG gene goes for one big protein, it's a P55, then is cleaved into the matrix protein, P24 capsid protein, the P7 nucleocapsid protein, for example. The pole region, again, is the enzyme, so the integrase, the uh, reverse transcriptase, and the RNase. Uh, those later become targets for antiretroviral therapy, as we'll see. And then the envelope uh, genes, the GP160, then cleave to GP41 and GP120. Those are the uh, membrane, transmembrane proteins and the membrane proteins. 
as far as how this is transmitted, two exclusive modes, sexual transmission and transfer of blood or blood products or body fluids. So this is quite similar to hepatitis B virus, but it is a less hardy virus than hepatitis B is, so it doesn't survive as long outside the host. It's more susceptible to heat, more susceptible to disinfectants. It must cross the epithelial cell barrier into the fluid compartment to cause disease. This is facilitated by patients who have genital ulcers uh, caused by other sexually transmitted diseases, such as herpes or syphilis, chancroid. So that break in the membrane tends to allow easier entry of the HIV virus into the host. So high levels of free HIV and infected leukocytes um, are key to transmission. Mucous membranes or percutaneous transfer is a significant risk. The specimens that have sufficient HIV in them to warrant um, transmission include blood, semen, vaginal secretions, and even breast milk. But there are body fluids that have such a low concentration, if any, that they are not a significant threat, and that would be sweat, tears, urine, and saliva. So if we look at the epidemiology of HIV infection in the U.S., uh, about 1 to 1.8 million cases per year usually. Uh, that, that's data from 2012. New cases have been relatively stable since the early 1990s. 35,000 or so reported new cases in 2011. 15,000 deaths uh, reported in 2010. Um, 636,000 since the beginning of the pandemic through 2010. Uh, so that's the number of deaths cumulatively through 2010. But the good news is that new therapies have lengthened lives and slowed the death rate. I'm sure you remember when HIV diagnosis was basically a death sentence. And when people got that diagnosis, they would quit their jobs, sell all their stuff, and get ready to die, basically. So then therapies came out, they got treated, they got better, their HIV viral loads went down, they had to get their job back, they had to buy all their stuff back. So this has actually had quite an impact on, on the disease. So this graph kind of shows um, what's been going on. So the, the blue and the um, tan uh, symbols are, are new cases. Okay, so you can see that that's fairly stable. And then the people living with HIV is actually increasing as we get new cases and they're, they're, they don't die, they continue to live because they're getting treated, the, the cases are going to go up of people living with HIV. But it's still the eighth leading cause of death in men, young men, 24 to 44 years of age. Males outnumber females. Blacks outnumber whites who outnumber Hispanics. Most cases are, as I mentioned, between 15 and 64 years of age. Very few in the very, in the very young ages and the very older ages. The older ages, I should say. I'm getting close to that number, so I don't want to say very old. The majority of cases are still seen in large metropolitan areas of New York, California, Florida, District of Columbia, and Texas. So this is the latest map uh, of the U.S. and the number of cases per 100,000. So white is the lowest, zero to five. And the state that I live in, Nebraska, is, is in that category. You can see Tennessee is uh, not quite uh, the highest, but it's um, 10 to 15 cases per 100,000. It's, uh, it's one of the higher ones. And this, this uh, uh, pie graph kind of shows the race distribution, as I mentioned earlier, so pretty much re rehash of that. Risk groups. Men having sex with men, 62.3% of new cases. That's increasing. Heterosexual partners of HIV carriers, 27% of new cases. A combination of uh, men having sex with men and IV drug users, about 3% of new cases. IV drug use itself, 7.4% uh, of new cases. Perinatal cases, very low now that we've recognized that that 
can be stopped using therapy, 127 total cases. Um, um, so not very many there. And then others would be uh, hemophiliacs, people getting transfusions, and then a very small number where a risk factor has not been identified. So what does that mean? Does that mean we have some risk factors that we're not aware of and we need to be worried about? No, it doesn't. What, what happens there is once they take and they look at people that have no obvious risk factors and they study them very closely, they find risk factors. People don't always tell you the truth. No, I, don't, I never used IV drug use drugs. I never did that. Well, yeah, you did. So that most of them, pretty much everybody that they've looked at close enough has one of these risk factors. So congenital neonatal infections, as I mentioned, is very, very low now. 127 cases in 2011 continues to decrease. And highly active antiretroviral therapy has prevented infections in the neonate when mom is identified soon enough to prevent that. Blood products, no longer a serious risk. All the testing that's done on the units uh, pretty much has eliminated that. Maybe one unit out of 1.5 million blood units by uh, 2010 estimate may have had HIV, may have slipped through and had HIV in it. Healthcare workers, uh, people like us, a few dozen cases, but not very many. And again, there's a few that, um, you know, at, at, unless you study them closely, don't have any apparent risk factor. You switch gears and go to Africa, see what's going on there. There, females outnumber males. The primary mode of transmission is now heterosexual contact, 90% of cases. There's some IV drug use uh, uh, cases as well. 1.7 million new cases, new infections in 2011. 23.5 million people living with HIV. Uh, mortality, 1.2 million deaths. 71% of global uh, HIV deaths are in Africa. Now, it sounds very bleak, and it is. It's devastated young, young uh, people, uh, you know, lots of orphans as a result of this. Just terrible, terrible impact in Africa. But there's good news. Many people uh, in Africa are now getting therapy. It's gone up, up from uh, the last figures I saw were less than 1% in, in the middle 2000, 2000, 2010, somewhere in there, up to maybe 30, 40% are now getting antiretroviral therapy. That's still too low, but uh, things are starting to turn around. You know, intervention uh, uh, efforts have had some impact there. Other countries, pandemics uh, are ongoing in Europe, Latin America, India, uh, Southeast Asia, Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union, about 1.5 million cases in 2011. Asia, 5.3 million cases, 440,000 new cases, 270,000 deaths. Latin America, 1.4 million, 140,000 new cases. So that's a little bit about uh, where HIV is found, how many cases, and what's going on. Let's look a little bit at the pathology. So HIV enters the cell, the dendritic cell, usually. It, uh, will then up eventually replicate itself and be shed by those cells. Uh, macrophages uh, get, get infected in the skin and the lymphatics, bone marrow and blood. Uh, eventually you'll get pro progressive destruction of the helper T cells, uh, monocytes, macrophages and B lymphocytes as well. So the glycoproteins that we talked about on the HIV surface bind to receptors on the host cells, either the CD4 receptor uh, or the CCR5 receptors, those would be found on macrophages, or the CXR, CXCR4 on the T cells. So we'll come back to those receptors in a minute. So basically they dock and fuse with those receptors. The virus gets in the cell. The reverse transcriptase then becomes active and makes uh, a DNA copy of the RNA genome. You might get an initially a lytic infection, maybe associated with some symptoms, as we'll see. Then the uh, virus becomes latent, and it gets integrated into the host genome and sort of remains quiescent for a while. The uh, integrase enzyme is important in, in doing that. 
if that patient then gets their immune system stimulated uh, for whatever reason, and, and our immune systems get stimulated a lot, uh, just go to a daycare center where there's lots of kids sniffling and coughing and you'll get your immune system stimulated. Uh, then the virus may come out and um, start, start its cycle. You'll get transcription of the proviral DNA. Uh, the messenger RNA will then be translated into the various proteins that the virus needs to assemble itself. Uh, it does that, buds out, lysis the cell, and we're, we're off. So lysis of the T cells, of the leukocytes, you get a leukopenia, loss of essential memory clones and stem cells, uh, formation of syncytia allows the virus to spread from cell to cell, then the syncytia itself lysis, viral loads start increasing, uh, cell infections uh, also increase, lysis increases, getting, giving you even greater viral loads. So you get the destruction of these important uh, lymphocytes, uh, once you get to a certain level, uh, 200 per microliter, that meets the definition of AIDS. And uh, the fact that your immune system is now fatally compromised pays the way for various infections and cancers. Uh, the virus itself is also cytotoxic in the central nervous system, affecting glial and other cells, can lead to peripheral nerve demyelination and encephalitis. As far as clinical manifestations, incubation period of about one to two weeks, then the patient may experience a vague mononucleosis-like syndrome. That would be now termed acute HIV infection. We'll come back to that in a minute. May be characterized by some fever, rash, maybe some oral ulcers, some night sweats, lymphadenopathy, maybe some fatigue, diarrhea, weight loss, arthralgias, and pharyngitis. Typically, that goes away, and it becomes asymptomatic for, for a number of years, up to 10 years. There are a small number of people that seem to not progress from there. They remain asymptomatic, uh, and it's thought that either this is a particular strange virus, or they, this the host doesn't have the right receptors, or uh, some reason for that. An interesting phenomenon that, that needs further study. So with continuing loss of the cells, opportunistic infections then become more likely, and some of these are considered AIDS-defining illness. So one way to get to AIDS is to, to measure your CD4 cells and be below that cutoff. Another way is to have certain opportunistic infections like pneumocystis uh, pneumonia, certain cancers like Kaposi sarcoma, some B-cell lymphomas, kind of a wasting syndrome and, and, and AIDS dementia. There's a uh, staging system that uh, the CDC has developed to um, uh, put uh, HIV infection in certain categories, one through three, and they're listed for you here. It's really based on the CD4 count and whether or not you have an AIDS-defining illness. Treatment, there's many of these drugs now out there. There are nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. So there's the reverse transcriptase, that's, that's one of the targets uh, of many of these drugs. There are also non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. There's protease inhibitors and there's fusion inhibitors. So typically, H, uh, uh, highly active antiretroviral therapy is composed of two uh, nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors plus either one non-nucleoside version or a protease inhibitor or a fusion inhibitor. Again, dramatic effect on disease pro progression, death and quality of life all very much improved. Now let's come back to acute HIV infection. And this is where things have changed a little bit, okay? So acute HIV infection is the time between a positive viral load and seroconversion, okay? So seroconversion when you have antibodies. So that viral load will precede that by a few days or so. During this time, patients have very high viral loads in their genital secretions and in their blood. And that hyperviremic state, you might call it, persists for 10 to 12 weeks. So the rate of transmission in, from these patients to their sexual partners or whatever, 
26 times higher than in established HIV infection. And this, as a result, may account for maybe as low as 10, but up to 50% of new cases. Just think about that for a minute. So if we could diagnose acute HIV infection, we can improve our understanding of transmission. We can intervene early, maybe limit that replication, and maybe even prevent the virus from integrating into the host cell genome, which is essentially, when, once that happens, it's incurable. It's sometimes manageable, but it's not curable. So the patients in this stage are maximally contagious. So early diagnosis gives us opportunities for treatment and prevention of subsequent cases. So this is why we are now hearing from the CDC that everyone should be screened for HIV infection. Again, people don't always tell you the truth about their activities. So you come in for your doctor's visit, get your blood pressure checked, they check on your, your lisanopril and your hyper, hydrochlorothiazide treatment and your, whatever else you're getting, and they test you for HIV. We shouldn't be insulted by that. The idea here is to catch these infections early and pr possibly prevent um, new cases. Then the second part of that is we need tests that pick up the infection as early as possible. And this has led to a fundamental shift in the philosophy of testing. And we'll talk about that more in a minute. So let's transition over to lab diagnosis. Three major categories of tests. Virologic methods, which is essentially culture. Serologic methods, antibodies and antigens and molecular methods, PCR tests, viral loads, that kind of thing. In the symptomatic high-risk patient, this is usually pretty straightforward. For the asymptomatic low-risk patient, it's more complex. And part of the old philosophy uh, has to do with the next bullet. When you had this diagnosis, that could have big consequences for your life, economic consequences, social, psychological. So you didn't want to give someone HIV infection when they didn't have it. That was bad. You didn't want to do that. So specificity was the, the, the coin of the realm in HIV testing, in the, in the old philosophy. So culture. So virus isolation, you get plasma or blood, peripheral blood mononuclear cells. Uh, you culture them, you grow HIV. This provides, obviously, direct evidence of infection. Sensitivity is pretty good. If your CD4 counts have uh, been uh, depleted quite a bit, it's lower if you're not quite that far along. Rarely necessary to di establish diagnosis, but it's a valuable research tool to study the viruses and look at their genes and mutations and what have you. Antigen detection, usually the P24 capsid uh, antigen is what we're talking about here. It's detectable by enzyme immunoassays. High titers in acutely patients prior to seroconversion uh, occur, usually day 7 to 14 after infection. After seroconversion, the antigen typically gets complex with antibodies that are now starting to be formed as well, and you can't find uh, the P24 antigen easily. Uh, then once disease uh, progression continues, you might see a uh, resurgence of the P24. Detects about uh, 4,000 vi virus particles. Interfering substances have been described. There are some false positives, and there's a neutralization uh, test that can be done. Most cases are diagnosed by um, detecting antibody to HIV-1 or HIV-2. Um, this would be seroconversion, so you didn't have antibodies, and now you do, so that's seroconversion. Third generation tests, which many are still using, uh, mean seroconversion time is 22 to 25 days. The newer fourth generation tests, which combine antibody detection with antigen detection, about five to 10 days sooner, time to detection. Sensitivity very high, specificity pretty good as well, 99.9, .9, 9, 98.8 respectively. So diagnosis has been a two-stage process. 
repeatedly reactive screening test, followed by a confirmatory assay. So what's going on with these generation tests? Basically, this has to do with the, how the antigen was, was uh, made for these antibody tests. So the first generation tests simply used infected T cell line lysates. Uh, second generation tests used uh, recombinant proteins. So they took the genes that coded for the protein, put them in E. coli, and made the proteins that way. Uh, third and fourth generation tests used recombinant antigens and oligopeptides. So what has what was been the effect of those changes? So first generation tests, a lot of biologic false positives with the lysate antigen due to antibodies to HLA proteins expressed in the lymphoid cell lines. Uh, antibodies were commonly found in multiparous women and in patients that had multiple transfusions. Mean seroconversion was 50 days. Second generation tests, less of these since they were recombinant proteins. The second generation tests picked up HIV-2 as well. Fewer um, uh, false positives, but still some. Um, since these were made in yeast and, and bacteria instead of uh, using T cell cell lines, some of their cross reactions were due to those antigens. Um, did not detect antibody to the highly divergent HIV subtypes very well, the N groups and the O groups. Mean serial conversion time down to 37 days. Third generation tests uses an antigen sandwich EIA, detects all classes of antibodies including groups O and N and O, greater sensitivity and early infection, mean time to serial conversion 22 days. Fourth generation tests now include detection of the P24 antigen as well as those antibodies mentioned in the third generation test. So earlier diagnosis down to 15 to 16 days. So these third and fourth generation tests, sensitivity of 99.5%. Still some false negatives, absent slow levels of antibodies or antigen, early and primary infection, okay? Very small percentage. Specificity greater than 99%, so fewer false positives. But if you have a low prevalence population, so your HIV rate is half percent, even a specificity of 99%, will give you a positive predictive value of only about 50%. That's back to giving a diagnosis of HIV infection in the patient that doesn't really have it. We'll come back to that point in a minute. Also, that we have out there is the rapid tests. We have a membrane EIA, some immunochromatographic methods. Uh, they can be done sometimes on oral specimens, on blood specimens. Very simple to do. Sensitivity and specificity are reasonably comparable to the lab performed test, but typically lower sensitivities and specificities in the field. So when a clinic is doing it or it's done in the ER, even though in highly controlled circumstances it's not, it's a very good test when people that um, like, like those and they, they're, they're very good at what they do, but they're not laboratorians, uh, sensitivity and specificity is lower. Several kits uh, are available, including some waived kits. There's even a new fourth generation rapid test that includes antigen detection. These tests are more expensive, so your run-of-the-mill lab-run HIV antibody test is two, three, four dollars. These rapid tests are 10, 12, 15 dollars. So you wouldn't want to do all your testing this way because your costs would go up quite a bit. They also tend to have a bit longer time to positivity than your lab run tests. And there's some questions about the detection of group N. So what I like to recommend is this test to be reserved for women coming into the hospital in labor, no prenatal care, we don't know if she's HIV infected, we wanna treat her and the baby if she is to stop the congenital infection so you do it, you have to have a rapid test, so you, you do it You do it in that setting. And then needle stick injuries, where you have a couple of hours to start uh, prophylactic, thera prophylactic therapy if they are in, uh, stuck with a needle from an HIV patient. So you need fast turnaround time there too. Not in other circumstances, not for convenience, not because the patient wants to know now, not because 
I like to do it in my clinic. Um, you, you get the idea. So one of the issues is what do you do if it's positive? Basically, they have to enter the algorithm, which I will be describing shortly. Uh, you have to kind of start all over. I mean, you can, you can implement the treatment uh, based on the result, but you need to start all over with the testing, essentially, if it's reactive. Now, for years, we've used the Western blot as the confirmatory test if the HIV EIA has become positive. And the reason we need a confirmatory test, again, is because if we have low prevalence of disease, even with high specificity, you're going to have a low positive predictive value. So you need to confirm it. So the use of the Western blot was essential to exclude these false positive and was a, a, the major part of the old algorithm. So what did, what did it do? Well, it detected antibodies too, but it detected them to specific proteins. Um, the antibodies to the gag proteins, for example, appeared the earliest, usually within 30 days, and those antibodies would decrease with disease progression. Uh, then the antibodies to the envelope genes would, would appear and they would persist. So with the coordinate use of the EIA and the Western blot, you achieved as close to 100% specificity as you could. Okay? Various criteria are out there for interpreting the Western blots. Typically, it's two bands or more. Sometimes it matters what bands are there. Sometimes uh, even a single band is considered positive, like for the Red Cross. They will exclude a unit if it has one band. They don't. You know, even if that's a false positive, that unit's out, okay? Which is probably appropriate. No bands, negative. Uh, one band or more, but not meeting the positive criteria would be indeterminate. So this is what a typical Western blot would look like. Um, let's see, lane six there is a control showing all the different antigens that you might see. Um, lane seven, I think, has one band, so that would be an indeterminate. Um, eight is clear, and then nine is obviously positive, et cetera. So a repeatedly reactive HIV, EIA, and a positive Western blot meant an HIV-1 infection under the old algorithm. Repeatedly reactive EIA and a negative or indeterminate Western blot could be one of several things. Could be a false positive EIA. Back in the day, that's what we considered most of these. It could be a recently acquired HIV infection within a few weeks. It could be HIV-2 infection. Okay, of course, the Western blot, you need a HIV-2 Western blot to confirm an HIV-2 infection. You can't do it with HIV-1 Western blot. Or it could be a group other than the M, which gave, typically gave variable results. What happens if you have a negative EIA? Absence of HIV infection provided no high-risk behavior or greater than or equal to six months since that high-risk behavior, essentially. Or it could be a recently acquired HIV infection within six months. Other confirmatory assays. So the multi-spot is a uh, test that differentiates HIV-1 from HIV-2, so it'll be positive for the antibodies, and it'll actually tell you which antibodies it is. There's an indirect immunofluorescence, there's a line immunoassay, uh, these are not used very often, and then there's nucleic acid testing, okay? Uh, two tests are FDA approved for confirmatory testing, this is for confirmatory testing. The whole logic, um, now whole logic, formerly Gen Probe, Aptima assay, and the Novartis assay. So let's get back to algorithm issues. So the philosophy or the focus has now changed from specificity to sensitivity. We really want to get all cases now. Even if that, remember when we, do, when we do, we set our point, break points, it's a balance, right? You set your break point low enough, you get maximal sensitivity, but now you have false positives. You do it the other way around, you have very few false positives, but you miss cases, okay? So, time to positivity and acute HIV is what's driving this. So fourth generation tests, 
give us earlier time to positivity, close to the viral load test, okay, 14 to 16 days versus 8 to 10 days. In fact, in one study, 89% of viral load positive, antibody negative specimens were positive by a fourth generation test. And of course, that test is cheaper than a viral load. Any molecular tests tend to be more expensive, usually at least $50. The Western blot takes a long time to become positive. And as a result, is no longer part of the testing algorithm. So the major confirmatory test is now a differentiation assay of which the multi-spot is one. I think the only one out there right now. So I'm going to show you a series of graphs that try to pound this message home. Maybe too, too much pounding, but it's an important message. So this graph here is time after HIV infection on the x-axis. There is no y-axis because we've got too many tests in there that have different measures. So the time between your, you, when you get HIV infection and when the first positive you might see in any test is called the eclipse period, okay? So then typically the, the molecular test will become positive first. You can see that arrow pointing up to about 10 days, okay? Then next, the dotted line starts appearing, and that's your fourth generation assay driven by the antigen portion of it, okay? So you can see when that becomes positive. The blue line is your third generation assay. That's just antibody. Good test, but just antibody. About 22 days. Notice the antigen returns to negative eventually. Okay. So that tells you approximately where these tests fall as to time to detection. Notice the second generation assays, the arrow pointing between 30 and 40 days when it became positive, and then the first generation assays were more like 50 days. Okay, pounding number one. Pounding number two. Okay, this is a graph now showing your copies uh, per mil in, on the y-axis followed by, uh, with uh, the x-axis being days following transmission. Similar graphs, so the graph itself, the line, that's your viral load. And then notice when the tests start becoming positive. Viral load first, P24 antigen next, your uh, third generation ELISA antibody tests. And notice where the Western blots starting to show up. P plus minus indeterminate, then finally positive, way down 30 or so days. Pounding number three. Kind of a similar thing, just kind of a line with, with with when the, the tests become positive, showing that the very top of, of the graph there West, is Western blot, the last test to become positive. Notice your point of care test, where it's at. Last pounding. So here, look at zero. That's when the Western blot becomes positive. Right around zero, we have our first generation tests and our lateral flow rapid tests. So, when that's all we had, the Western blot was pretty good. I mean, they all became positive right around the same time. And even with the second generation tests, it was within seven days. But then the newer tests, the third generation tests, the fourth generation tests, and the molecular tests, notice when they become positive relative to the Western blot. So we're potentially missing all those cases. So the new algorithm. Fourth generation antigen antibody test as your initial test. If reactive, then an HIV antibody differentiation assay as your confirmatory test. Western blot does not play into this any longer. If the differentiation test is negative, why might that happen? Well, we may have antigen, but no antibodies yet. So that still could be, that could still be a real infection. So then you go to a nucleic acid test. And if that's 
positive, by definition, you have acute HIV infection. So if you use a rapid test and it's positive, you have to start from the fourth generation test. It's the next thing you do. I'm not saying you can't act on that positive rapid test if it's a pregnant woman or if it's a needle stick, you can give therapy, but to get all the way through to the confirmed diagnosis, you have to start the algorithm all over again. So here's what it kind of looks like, and this has pub been published by the CDC as of uh, late June of this year, not very long ago. It's been long awaited. Uh, there have been public health labs that have put out something similar because we got tired of waiting for them, the CDC, to do it. No offense to the CDC. So here we go with our uh, fourth generation test, positive, you do your differentiation test, and you get a positive one, then you have an HIV-1 infection, a positive two, you have HIV-2 infection. If both are positive, then you just say it's positive. You don't, you don't, typically these are not mixed infections. They're typically HIV-1 infections. Then if you have an indeterminate, then you go to your nucleic acid test. If it's negative, then you're negative. Now, if you have a high-risk patient where, remember, the antigen is good, but it's not going to be positive before the viral load. So if you think you have one of these high-risk patients just got infected, then you can go to your nucleic acid test if your screening fourth generation is negative. Okay, now let's talk about HIV-2 for a second. So the early HIV-1 tests developed in the 80s and 90s had sensitivity for HIV-2 somewhere around 60 to 90 percent. Mid-1990s, uh, the HIV-1 slash 2 assays came out, and our sensitivity for HIV-2 2 was now 99.5 percent. Of course, the multi-spot will differentiate the two very nicely. And, but other than that, you need HIV-2 specific tests to get any further. HIV-2 is very low prevalence in the U.S. No routine testing is recommended. Possibly blood banks uh, might want to do this, or you do it if it's indicated. So it's highly prevalent in West Africa. Um, if you do an HIV-1 Western blot, which uh, you wouldn't be doing anymore under the new algorithm, it might be positive if it's an HIV-2 infection. So you're thinking it's HIV-1, but it's really HIV-2. Is that a problem? Yes. So this would be cryptic HIV-2 infection and your patient may clinically deteriorate when they're being treated for HIV-1, despite undetectable viral load levels for HIV-1, which indicate you're succeeding, because HIV-2 does not respond to the non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors or in the protease inhibitors. So you need HIV-2 tests once you get down to this point. Let's talk about molecular tests for a little bit. So there's a qualitative proviral PCR, DNA PCR test. So this looks for the HIV proviral DNA, the DNA, in the peripheral blood mononuclear cells. This is the integrated virus. Targets the gag and the pole genes. Very good sensitivity and specificity. Um, typically cutoff is about 10 copies per uh, mil. Uh, not really used very much. Uh, you can detect infection in the neonate this way. Remember, you can't do serologic tests in the neonate. They have a mom's antibody present, okay? So that an test, antibody testing doesn't work very well. So you can do this in the neonate. Uh, you can do it at birth. You can do it four to six weeks if it's negative. You can do it eight to 16 weeks later if it's still negative. Usually that's, that's enough times. If it's positive at birth, then you're done. There's a qualitative transcription-mediated amplification test, sensitivity 13 copies, earlier diagnosis, six days before the P24 antigen. Can be used for blood donor screening, can detect rare units that are negative for antibodies. Risk is one, um, one in two million units for that happening. Uh, can also use it to diagnose in the neonate. Can be used as a confirmatory test. In the old days, we could use that to diagnose or to resolve an indeterminate Western blot. The viral load tests, so these are now quantitative PCRs, are used to monitor disease progression and response to therapy and give you some idea of how infectious the patient is. 
several methods out there, reverse transcriptase PCR, uh, nucleic acid sequence-based amplification, transcription-mediated amplification, branched-chain DNA, all highly correlated uh, with each other. Low limit of detection is now around 20 copies per mil. Earlier generation tests tended to have low precision at the low end, but the, they're much better now. Again, back to first generation assays, it had limited sensitivity for the detection and quantitation of non-B types, non-B clades. And the branch chain DNA was actually the preferred test. You had someone with a travel history that might not have had a B clade virus. But now the third, second and third generation assays have fixed that problem. Um, in addition to having a lower limit of detection, it detects all the different groups. Interassay variability of these methods is a problem. You'd want to use for a single patient the same laboratory using the same test, uh, so to minimize the, Im the impact of that. Even serial testing using the same test on a patient that does not have, uh, is not getting treated, there's some biologic variation in the viral load up to about a three-tenths of a log. So you need changes of about half a log or more to uh, determine that this is a significant change in what's going on in the patient. Plasma, HIV viral load levels do correlate with the stage of the disease, as does the CD4 count. High, high titers uh, typically mean asympt or symptomatic disease or AIDS. Low titers often are asymptomatic. If you have greater than 100,000 copies within six months of seroconversion, 10 times more likely to develop AIDS within five years. So there's some charts in, in there that kind of correlate viral load with the CD4 count and then uh, uh, percent of patients progressing to age within six years and percent of patients dying. So basically, the higher the load, the lower your CD4 count, the more likely that's going to happen. So you can use this test to assess the effectiveness of therapy. Um, decrease in HIV RNA means reduction in risk of disease progression. Uh, Three-tenths of a log disc decrease in the viral load gives you a 30 percent reduced risks, risk of progression to AIDS. One log would be 67 percent. And so these are important prognostic indicators, as mentioned. So typically, your, your viral load will behave like this when you start treatment of a patient. Immune activation can cause a transient rise in viral load. So um, we noticed when patients were given flu vaccine, their viral loads tended to go up. Um, that's just that, that immune stimulation phenomenon I mentioned earlier. Again, for individual patients, use the same lab. Two baselines are recommended prior to starting therapy, uh, then repeating the viral load uh, two to eight weeks after starting therapy. You're expecting a two-log decline within eight weeks in the naive patient, and then you repeat it every uh, several months. Use of the viral load test for diagnosis uh, is not approved by the FDA. Its use in that fashion is controversial. Seems to have good sensitivity, at least. Specificity is an issue. Um, false positives can occur at low viral loads. Uh, sometimes done on uh, donated uh, blood as a pool test to uh, uh, have a more sensitive way of picking up. Remember, the, the testing of blood units is a different thing. It's getting those units out rather than diagnosing disease. Drug resistance testing, uh, genotypic methods that look for mutations, coding for drug resistance. There are phenotypic me methods that are typically like a viral antimicrobial susceptibility test with an inhibitory concentration 50 percent, and then a virtual phenotypic methods, which uh, kind of combine the two. Uh, they have their advantages and disadvantages. Um, they're uh, genotypic assays are fast and easy, low cost, detect resistance earlier, but the disadvantages that resistant mutants have to be at least 25 percent of the population of the virus. You have to have at least a, a 1,000 viral load, and mutations sometimes don't correlate with the phenotype, and cross resistance can occur. Phenotypic assays, familiar format like an MIC that we, that we use in, in microbiology. Uh, can demonstrate resistance in the absence of knowing the genetic mechanism for that resistance, but some of the same disadvantages as well, and at higher cost, and it's harder to find. Drug resistance testing is important to do 
uh, when you select initial therapy. Uh, it's especially important to do when you're switching the regimen. Risk of failure is very high if you don't do uh, drug resistance testing. You don't want to fail therapy in someone like a pregnant woman, for example, and areas with high prevalence of resistance, you, you need to do testing. Finally, there's a tropism assay, coming back to those receptors. So N HIV entry into target cells through the receptors that I mentioned before. If it happens to be the CCR5, there are now antagonists for that receptor. Um, a plavrox blocks that, blocks that receptor, prevents entry. So it can be used for therapy if that receptor is present. So the tropism assay basically makes a recombinant HIV from the patient's virus, then determines whether it can enter a cell culture with or without the antagonist that has the uh, uh, receptor. So summarize HIV infection is uh, still highly prevalent worldwide. Identifying acute HIV infection is the, the, the word of the day. Uh, it's important to intervene at that stage to prevent transmission and to even prevent latency and then subsequent disease in that uh, individual patient. HIV tests are evolved and are positive earlier in the course of disease. Testing is focused more from a specificity perspective to a sensitivity perspective. That's not to say we don't want specificity, but we want to make sure we catch all the patients as early as possible. And then tests for therapy uh, selection and monitoring also are available. 